Welcome to Indigenous and Multicultural Education. Uh, in this um, subject, I do mini lectures just to help you if you're learning. And in this uh, week for topic one, we're learning about um, various aspects of Indigenous culture and also starting to get into some early encounters for Indigenous peoples before we get into uh, understanding uh, Indigenous history and the history of Australia. So one of the things that's important to understand is that there are lots and lots of different Indigenous nations and Indigenous language groups. Um, so one size does not fit all um, is something that's really important to keep in mind. It's also important to keep in mind that Indigenous people, um, the land is the centre of their spirituality and that they may not uh, want to uh, leave their land. Um, and the fact that uh, in their history we've removed them from their land and put them in random places um, has been a big issue. Uh, but one of the main takeaways for teachers is that we have to remember that a lot of Indigenous people have been displaced and a lot of Indigenous people um, may not grow up learning English as their first language. So depending on where you live, um, you may have a lot of Indigenous people that, um, <coughs> uh, that uh, don't speak English as their first language or even their second language. So something for, about this course is also considering how we teach um, English as second language learners. Uh, one of the other things um, about Indigenous culture that I think is a really important one is this concept of eye contact. Um, in Australian culture and Western culture, it's considered um, polite to have eye contact when you're talking to someone. Um, but in Indigenous culture, it's quite considered quite rude and intimidating. So something to be aware of is that um, it's um, the norm for Indigenous students not to have eye contact, um, complete eye contact when they're talking to you. Uh, another thing that can be the norm, and I'm going to use this picture for two different facts, is that um, in conversations with Indigenous young people, there may be long periods of silence. And that's actually a normal thing in Indigenous culture to um, show respect and to show that you are listening and thinking about what the person has said. So it's important to, um, to uh, not try to fill the gap like in Western culture when there's an awkward silence, um, but to wait for their body language um, to change to indicate that they're ready to start talking again. Another thing that's really interesting um, for Indigenous students that's really important is shame. Um, Indigenous students can have quite um, a priority on private information and public shame can really um, be something that shuts Indigenous students down. So when you talk to Indigenous students about things that might be considered private, uh, you need to make sure you do it in a discreet way, um, otherwise um, they will shut down because they will feel shamed. Um, things like their faces will go straight to their desk and not have eye contact at all, not even in your direction. Um, so, for example, things like um, if you need to keep them back for detention, maybe the whole class doesn't need to know that. Maybe only the Indigenous student needs to know that. Uh, when it comes to going to the counsellor, um, the last thing you want is someone knocking on the door and saying, hey, mate, you need to go to the counsellor now. Um, what was, is better is to say, hey, let's, can you just step outside for a minute and then maybe tell them in private that they've got an appointment with the counsellor. So make sure, one of the things that we need to make sure that we're not shaming um, another practice that we're going to talk about um, a lot more, which can be, I found it to be a brilliant teaching strategy, has been yarning circles. Uh, it's really important to understand that a yarning circle isn't just um, show and tell. It's not, um, it's a little bit more than a discussion. Um, but we it's about understanding that Indigenous children have grown up 
um, traditionally, before colonisation, um, there were traditional ways of transmitting knowledge. And uh, the yarning circle um, is about first stating this is the topic we're going to talk about and then having a discussion. Now, I'll note that um, for my uh, local Indigenous country um, is Darkenjung, which is uh, around here somewhere. Um, we were told by our Indigenous liaison uh, not to wear shoes in uh, the yarning circle. Um, and the reason for that was because it was about being connected with um, nature and being connected with God. Um, it's seeing, um, talking about important issues as um, a sacred thing. And our Indigenous liaison, who was also a Christian, said because God created the earth, um, taking your shoes off and planting your feet flat on the ground is a reminder that in everything um, God is omnipotent and that God is in charge. And it's a, and for that community, um, it's a sign of um, respect to God. Um, but there's lots and lots of Indigenous cultures and I assume that these sorts of traditions um, will change from place to place. Um, as well as some basics about Aboriginal culture, that's just giving you a little bit of a taster. There's so much more we could talk about and we can go into so much detail um, with Indigenous cultures and um, you could talk about the, the different levels of it, about um, the difference between rural to um, urban cultures. Um, but I want to also bring up some common misconceptions that are relevant to Indigenous culture. One of the first things that's important to understand is that Captain Cook, firstly, he was not on the first fleet. Um, that was Captain Arthur Philip who came on the first fleet. But Captain Cook was not the first uh, Westerner to visit um, Australia and to visit Indigenous peoples. There were lots and lots of explorers that had come to Australia before, such as Abel Tasman, who did two voyages to Australia, which is where we've gotten the name Tasmania from. Then there was also um, different expeditions by um, William Yance, who was looking for opportunities to trade. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that Indigenous um, Australians were not um, as isolated as we, we might assume. When Captain Cook um, came to Australia, he declared Australia to be terra nullius. No one's living here. Um, nothing's here. Um, but one example is that Indigenous people did actually already have trade with other countries, um, the most significant being Sulawesi uh, in Indonesia, where um, uh, Mackesons for hundreds and hundreds of years were travelling to the Northern Territory primarily to trade in sea cucumbers. Um, but they also traded in a lot of other articles like tobacco um, and other uh, items as well. And the trade did manage to get um, as far as the Philippines and to China. So... Um, there's a little bit of myth-busting about, um, firstly, Captain Cook didn't discover Australia. There were people already there who were already interacting with the rest of the world. Um, now, of course, on the eastern coast, we don't have any evidence of this. Um, <clears throat> but it's just an example uh, that uh, Captain Cook was not the first person to interact with Indigenous peoples. Um, when it comes to Indigenous culture, we also need to be aware of how Indigenous people see the past. And this is really important, especially when you're teaching English and when you're teaching history. Um, one of the biggest debates that has happened in recent times has been the Wind Shuttle versus uh, Reynolds debate. Um, so uh, Reynolds... Um, so Henry Reynolds, he um, was a researcher in the 60s and 70s. Um, he befriended Eddie Marbo, 
which was the um, big land rights movement. And in his history, he was the first person to say um, that basically the colonists were invaders. Um, He talks about violence against Aboriginal people and he talks about displacement of land. Whereas Windshuttle um, offers an opposite argument saying that Henry Reynolds' um, uh, ideas are not based on reliable sources and that for the most part um, Australia's colonisation was peaceful. And one of the things we have to be aware of is that textbooks um, can have drastically different interpretations of what they say about original Aboriginal culture. Um, So as an example, um, I've forgotten this elder's name. I had it earlier. I might just... uh, No, I'm going to lose it. Um, But I'll put this in the um, Moodle page. But this is a story of um, a lady who was in class one day and um, she was in a normal um, Australian school and they were learning about Captain Cook coming to Australia. And in Captain Cook's journals, when the Indigenous people came down the coast calling out Warra Warra Warra, um, the Captain Cook says in his journal that he shot over their heads and then they dispersed and ran away. And this lady, when she was a student, jumped up in class and said, no, that's not right. That happened to my great-grandfather and he was actually shot and killed. Um, So from um, uh, 1770, which is when Captain Cook first explored the eastern coast, um, there have been different stories and oral traditions that have been passed down to Aboriginal people. So what you teach in the textbook might not be what they have learnt at home. And it's really important to understand that uh, Indigenous cultures uh, have oral teachings of history that may be different to um, what historians have said or um, to what the textbook says. And historians now are, are starting even more so to start to listen to these oral histories as a perspective that might shed more light onto what happened. So, for example, um, when Captain Cook went back to England, he took with him um, a group of Indigenous shields. And to our surprise, when a historian recently investigated it, they discovered bullet holes in the shields, which is actually proving uh, the oral history to be correct, that uh, Captain Cook did not shoot over their heads, but they shot at them and actually killed a large number of them. Now, because there's only a small number of shields, um, it's hard to say if it was a massacre, um, if it was an all-out war, um, because definitely Captain Cook's journals are biased, um, and there's also issues with um, the accuracy of oral history. Um, But we do have to be aware that um, it's not the first time that an oral history has proven to be the correct history. And that's something that we need to be aware of with Indigenous culture. Another example that's been in the media has been with Bruce Pascoe with Dark Emu. So Bruce Pascoe has um, argued that Indigenous culture, they had um, built structures they had uh, farming and they had engineering. So, for example, um, his thesis is that um, uh, Indigenous people had farms without fences. So what they would do is they would burn certain areas of land so that animals like kangaroos and emus would stay in one spot. And when that happened, they could plant all sorts of vegetables and fruits Um, in other areas that was good for growing vegetables and fruits. But the problem was when uh, the white colonists came along, um, there are reports of the first colonists saying how soft the soil is, Um, but within a few years, the trampling with sheep and um, cows had compacted all of the soil and had ruined all of the indigenous crops. So it's hard to say just how much... um, how much uh, 
farming had been going on and how much purposeful burning had happened to create farming areas. Um, but this is where archaeology comes in. And whether you agree with Bruce Pascoe or not, there are definitely um, some uh, historians who are very critical of his theory. Um, archaeologists have found different structures that suggest Indigenous people um, did, have a, um, did have a system of engineering. Um, they did build, they did farm, they had irrigation. Um, so, for example, this is a fish trap that has been discovered. Um, that was built. Um, and this is another example of a fish trap. Um, other examples are housing. Um, so Pasco talks about when Mitchell crossed the um, Blue Mountains and was doing um, excavation and surveying, um, that he wrote in his journals about these um, dome um, kind of structures that Indigenous people had built. And um, Pasco argues that um, Indigenous people did have, in various places, they did have stone structures and housing, and they did have um, communal houses that were in dome structures that could house as much as, now this is in Queensland, not, not in New South Wales, um, that could house up to 50 people, is what Pasco says. Um, but once again, um, there are debates as to when those structures were actually made. Um, were they made after white settlement um, or were they always there? And so it's important to understand that um, when it comes to Indigenous culture, there is a perspective out there that Indigenous people were not um, nomads, that they did farm, um, they did manage the land, they had um, a concept of engineering, uh, a concept of math and science, and they also built permanent structures. And um, more and more historians, I think, are agreeing with this idea today. Um, but I think this is really important to be aware of. So I hope this has um, uh, made you think a bit about Indigenous culture. I'm sure that some of you guys out there know much more about it than I do. So if you've got any articles or any thoughts, feel free to leave it in the forum. Um, and yeah, I would love to hear your thoughts about the different debates and what you think about um, Aboriginal culture.